and gentlemen, he serves in a, as an advisor to governments and leading companies across the world as they craft digital strategies. Today at the IAA Summit, he's here to talk about the change and its effects. With a huge round of applause, welcome on stage a person who's going to talk to you about no matter how much things change, they will remain the same. Ladies and gentlemen, he is the founder and director, Center for the Digital Future USA, USA. Mr. Mr. Jeffrey. I have Bye. never been in an event where so many speakers needed no introduction. <laughs> whether it was Shah Rukh Khan, whether it was the greatest athlete in the world, the Swami, I'm the guy who actually needs the introduction. So, uh, but I am delighted to be here. I've never been in this part of India before. It is really exciting to be in God's country. Incidentally, God, another person who needs no introduction. <laughs> anyway, I, um, I'm, an, I'm a television guy. I've spent most of my life in the world of television, the most powerful medium ever invented. And in the work I did in television, I was always taught that we blew it where television was concerned. We lost a great opportunity. Television was the only mass medium we knew ahead of time was going to be a mass medium. And what I was taught that we should have done but didn't do is we should have tracked people before they had television. And in the 90s, I became convinced that digital was going to be even more important than television so 15 years ago, we launched this massive project, first in the United States, now in 46 countries around the world. Sadly, not in India, but that's one of the reasons I'm here. We are desperately looking for an Indian partner, but trying to understand how digital has changed people's lives. So let me share a little bit of that with you. I know it's late. Let me try to be as animated as I possibly can. All those other speakers came up here and had your respect because they'd earned it over your lifetimes. I'm going to try to earn it during this talk. We'll see where we get. But we'll start with the fact that in 1975, across most of the world, people spent 16 hours a week in front of a screen. Last year, it was 47 hours. And we think those 47 hours will be over 60 in the next five to eight years. But even if you forget the 60, just look at 47, that's over a quarter of all time. If you factor in sleep, which is sort of important, it's over a third of all awake time. 47 hours is really pretty remarkable. Incidentally, those 16 hours in 1975 were those 16 hours were one screen in the home on a schedule. Those 47 hours are three, or depending on how you count tablets and watches, four screens. I think everybody counts screens the same way, but just to be sure, television is the first screen, computers are the second screen, smartphones are the third screen, Movie theater owners have been complaining for a generation, hey, we're the fourth screen. Nobody takes that very seriously, probably because you don't own that screen or even rent it. You just use it for two hours. And uh, five years ago, when the iPad came out, and it's hard to believe that a device that has changed the world is only a little over five years old, although we could have said that when the iPad was only out for a year. But when the iPad came out, my job was to look at this thing and say, is this the fourth screen, or does it replace the second screen? We firmly believe it's replacing the second screen. We think the PC, the personal computer, is going away, except for 4 to 6% of the population who will continue to use it probably forever. That 4 to 6% computer-assisted designers, heavy-duty number crunchers, big writers, college students while they're in college. To the rest of us, a PC is a needlessly complex device, takes too long to boot, takes too long to learn, one out of every 30 times encounters the blue screen of death. Now we're looking at whether the watch 
is the four screen. Now, I've been on record. My job's to do all kind of predictions. I just made one saying we think the PC will not survive, except for 4 to 6 percent of the population. I've been on record for three years before the Apple Watch saying we don't think a generation that has never worn watches is going to wear smart watches either. Now, Apple has come out with the best of all the watches we've seen so far, which interestingly, they call the Apple Watch, not the iWatch. I asked some of my friends at Apple, they'll never tell you anything, but I asked why the iPod, the iPhone, the iPad, but not the iWatch. The best answer I could get, and it's not verified, is this is the first device to come out after Steve Jobs and they want to distinguish the post-Jobs era from the Jobs era. But the problem with the watch is really interesting. First, the battery. Because the watch is so small, the battery has to be small. People who are using the Apple Watch and are actually using the phone in it report that they're getting three hours of battery life. And I think we're all sick of devices we have to charge and watch the battery all the time. And the other problem with the Apple Watch is it requires a Bluetooth connection to a smartphone. And if you have to have your smartphone in your pocket already, why bother with the little screen on the watch? I have friends who love to go running and do exercise who would love a watch so that they didn't have to carry their smartphone, but a watch with their smartphone doesn't work. Apple's done something sort of interesting with their watch. They've actually made it into a luxury item. They've priced it in American dollars from $350 to $17,000, depending on how quickly you want to get robbed. Uh, but nonetheless, we'll see what happens. But I think we're already starting to see signs that the watch is really not going to catch fire. So just to look for a couple of minutes at the, f at the three screens that dominate our lives, I mentioned already we think the second screen is going away. As we've heard throughout this conference, the third screen, the smartphone, is the center of our lives. In the work we do, we're now seeing millions of people who have never accessed the internet anyway, except on a smartphone. Uh, I could give you a thousand examples of how important smartphones are to us, but I'll give you just two. Well, first example, we've discovered people almost never lose their smartphones. They can drop them in the street, and they can break. How many of you have ever had a broken screen? You can drop them in the bathtub or, God forbid, the toilet and get it wet. How many of you have ever done that? For me, it was the bathtub, not the toilet. I don't know what I would have done with the toilet. They can be stolen, but we almost never lose them. And the reason we almost never lose them is that if you leave your phone on the table where you're sitting, you couldn't even get near that door before you're accessing it, noticing it's gone. You can't get far enough away from it to lose it. I think that has nothing to do with me for some reason. Uh, whereas if I left a credit card on a table in a restaurant, it might take me days to notice it's gone. The other, the other example of how important these devices are is I've had one of these big Samsung phones for a couple of years now, before Apple came out with their 6 Plus. And frequently, I would be sitting at a table, and someone would say to me, can I look at your phone? And the answer is, of course you can look at my phone. I have no dirty pictures on it. I have nothing that I would mind any of you seeing, but I've noticed that when I hold and hand my phone over to you, who I like and trust, after about 30 seconds, I start saying to myself, only to myself, I don't say it out loud, I don't think I'm rude enough to say it out loud, but I say to myself, give it back. That's mine, damn it. That's not yours. And then, interestingly, on this theme of old and what goes around, the first screen in 2015, we heard a little bit of that from Samir, 
the first screen is the screen that is changing the most. Television. This is the year that television, in my view, is at the tipping point again. We're seeing services that are going over the top, selling directly to consumers, not going through the air, not using cable or satellite. We're seeing teenagers who go out and when they graduate college and get their first apartments, not buying television sets. But that's not lack of interest in television. Interest in television and video is greater than anything we've seen in the last 50 years. But television is changing. We don't watch crap anymore on television, or put better, we don't watch what is crap to us through streaming, through DVRs, through other technologies. We only watch the kind of television we want to watch. Moving on just a little bit. Uh, I, I'm lucky. I get to spend all this time with brands. I get to advise brands. I get to learn more about what they're doing. And I find that in the world of technology, almost everybody's nervous and uncomfortable. Uh, even the brands that I think do it really well and get digital very well, which would be Unilever, Nestle, uh, Nike, Coca-Cola, American Express, think they're behind. The ones that are behind know they're behind, but nobody's comfortable. Two examples of this. About three years ago, I was at the Google Zeitgeist at the Google main campus in Mountain View having a conversation with the chief marketing officer of one of the biggest consumer packaged good companies on the planet. And I was talking to this guy who's a friend, asking him all these questions about social media and digital interaction, and he was very uncomfortable. He didn't want to answer the questions. He was being sort of evasive. I don't know why he agreed to be in the session. And then finally, I got frustrated, and I turned to him, and I said, come on, Jim. You can admit it. If I got you alone late at night, filled you with alcohol, you can confess. Don't you wish the internet would just go away? And he said, no, we love the internet. It puts us in touch with our customers. It teaches us things we've never known. And then as we're walking off stage, <coughs> He turned to me and he said, you have no idea how often I wish it would go away. <laughs> Things were so much easier and so much more clear. Second example, about a year ago, I was having dinner with the chief marketing officer of Kimberly Clark. If you're not familiar with Kimberly Clark, you will from this example. I don't think this will offend anybody. I think it's sort of cute. The CMO of Kimberly Clark was saying to me, you want to know what we do at Kimberly Clark? If it leaks from the human body, we sell a product. They make Kleenex, toilet paper, feminine hygiene products. They make Huggies, the diapers for babies. Depend, you're not supposed to call them diapers. The undergarments for adults. And his question was, do people really want to have a relationship with the company that makes their toilet paper? And the answer is they do. People have a lot to say about toilet paper. People want to know which way do you hang it, how much of it should you use, should you double it over. Even the innovation of taking the roll out of the toilet paper came from consumers. But if people want to have a relationship with the company that makes their toilet paper, they want to have a relationship with every company. So I don't pretend to offer advice or tell people what to do, but the one piece of advice I offer to brands, to journalists, to parents, and I offer to you as well as to myself, is your learning curve must be steeper than your action curve. Your job is to study, learn, understand. You don't have to invest. You don't have to spend lots of money. You don't have to have elaborate policies, but you have to learn. For example, six years ago, I was telling every brand who would listen to me, learn everything there is to learn about Second Life. Second Life, the virtual reality community where you had an avatar, 
You could use dollars, which were called Linden dollars, named after the laboratory that started Second Life. Those were dollars that were convertible into real dollars. You could build an island, as General Motors did. You could build a consulate, as the Swedish government did. Within a year, I was telling every brand who would listen to me, if you're on Second Life, get the hell out as fast as you possibly can. It was filled with terrorism. It was filled with theft. It was filled with pornography. I remember there was a woman being interviewed about a year ago. She was complaining, my husband spends all his time in Second Life. He has a wife in Second Life. They have sex. They go shopping. She seemed much more annoyed that they went shopping than that they had sex. And then she admitted, but he's never met this woman. They've never talked on the phone. Do I have a problem? I think she does. Twitter, you learned about Twitter yesterday. Twitter knows that I think this. When I first learned about Twitter, it was the stupidest thing I had ever seen. I don't care what you had for lunch yesterday, with two exceptions. If you had the best meal of your life, I'd love to hear about that. And if you went to my favorite restaurant and you got sick, I need to hear about that. But other than that, I don't care what you had for lunch. But then we learned that the first reports of terrorism in Mumbai came from Twitter. Twitter became where people were learning about plane crashes. It became an indispensable news source. Twitter transformed how Hollywood and Bollywood release movies. In California, if the movie studios have what they know is a bad movie, they would not show it to critics ahead of time. They would heavily market it, and word of mouth would take three or four days to kill it. And then Twitter now, we learned this with a sequel, if you know the film Bruno, the sort of kind of sequel to Borat starring Sasha Baron Cohen. Twitter killed that film in 30 minutes. It's how fast it stopped people who were actually on their way to the movie theater getting tweets who decided not to go based on those tweets. So Twitter now, of course, has played, we're still assessing what its role has been in the Arab Spring. We're still assessing what the outcome of the Arab Spring will be. Twitter has become an indispensable customer service tool, probably the best customer service tool on the planet. So the job of brands and everyone else is to study, is to learn this stuff, is to dabble. Two examples of things in now and in the future. Google Glass. Google Glass has gotten a bad rap. The people who experiment, and Google has sort of pulled back from Google Glass a little bit for the time being. The people who were the first owners of Google Glass, and you had to be invited, and it was $1,500, so you had to be wealthy, and uh, they sort of got a bad reputation. There was all of a sudden people were calling all the people wearing Google Glass glass holes, um, which in many ways was a well-deserved -deser name. But what Google Glass is trying to do is very powerful, to put the internet right here. When I started my work 15 years ago, everybody connected to the internet with a PC on the desk and a hard wire to the wall. And the first mobile internet we saw it didn't come till about 2004 when we had laptops and Wi-Fi when you could literally put the internet on your laptop. Smartphones then let us put the internet here and all Google Glass does is move it to here. Now some of my friends cynically say that's just a stopgap measure until we implant the chip in the brain. But nonetheless, the idea of having the internet here is very powerful. And you heard Ralph talk a little bit about virtual reality, which is now beginning to really make an appearance. I work with some of the biggest retailers in the world and my advice to them is you don't have to have a Google Glass or an Oculus policy. You don't have to spend millions of dollars. You have to go out and buy a couple of pair. And you have to begin to understand how will your, how will your business change if all of your customers walk in wearing Google Glass 
or virtual reality goggles. But the other technology that has not been talked about here, so I'll talk about just for a minute or two, that I think is the most exciting technology for the rest of my life is driverless cars. Driverless cars are now legal in California. Google has done 3, kilo, 3 million kilometers of testing. Not a single incident caused by the cars. There have been about six crashes for people crashing into the driverless cars, but those were the driver's fault. The only incidents driverless cars have caused have been people freaking out when they see the driverless cars. Google has had to hire people to sit in the driver's seat and pretend they're driving. They're, of course, not allowed to do a thing, but they're just sitting there so the people on the highway don't get nervous. But I think we all know driverless cars are coming, and Tesla and Mercedes and Audi are already talking about when they're going to release theirs. But I think it's fun to look at how that technology will change everything. The first thing that happens is attention will be placed in a place that's never been put before, in the back seat of the car. The back seat's going to be a big sofa so that you can drag yourself out of bed and throw yourself in the back of the car and sleep on your commute, which if you're in Los Angeles is about two hours. Uh, in addition to sleeping, there'll be a desk connection to the cloud with all of your files. There'll be an entertainment center. And I was in China recently, and some Chinese women at a talk I was doing pointed out there will also be a full-length mirror in the back seat of the car so women can put on their makeup. Sometimes now I drive to work and I see women putting on their makeup in the rear view mirror. And now they'll have a full mirror. The car will drop you off at work. It will then come back and get you at the time you've predetermined. You, of course, can override that with your smartphone. And the car will go park somewhere free or inexpensively. Uh, your car will take your children to all their after-school activities and to school itself. Your kids will have an app in, the car, uh, in their smartphone, or if they're too young to have a smartphone, they'll wear a little bracelet so that when the car shows up, only they can get into the car safely, that no one else can get in the car. The car will allow people who are blind or handicapped to get around as easily as those who are not. It will end the awkward conversation with your parents and grandparents where you have to take the car keys away when they can no longer drive. Uh, it will be the end of drunk driving because instead of a designated car, designated driver, there will be a designated car. And I think, and Elon Musk just said this, and, uh, and I was really delighted to hear him say it, I think we're going to get to the point in 30 years where we're not going to let human beings drive. <laughs> now, I live in the driving cop capital of the world, Los Angeles. I have friends who say, I'll never tolerate that. I love driving. Well, I have friends who love to ride horses, but you can't ride horses through major cities. If you love to ride horses, you have to go to a ranch or a farm. I think in 30 years, if you love cars, you'll have to go to a track and race car and drive cars. Because if we take human beings out of the driving equation, then we'll see the end of auto accidents, which will mean the end of auto insurance and the end of lawyers taking advantage of auto accidents. It will, in America, 34,000 people a year die on the highways. And I'm told that in India, it's proportionate. I know in China, it's even higher than that proportion. So we're talking about saving hundreds of thousands of lives. We are reducing, not eliminating pollution, because cars that don't speed up and slow down but drive at a regular pace use less energy. And cars can get closer together, so congestion will be minimized a little bit. And of course, the most exciting thing, which some of you, if you've been following along with me, are probably already thinking about, is when your car drops you off at work, why is it still your car? It will, what will actually happen is your car will, the car will drop you off at work, 
and then it will go be somebody else's car. And then the car that comes back to get you at the end of the day may only by coincidence be the same car that took you to work in the morning. Uh, I think people will buy a level of car. There will probably be four levels of car. One, the most basic kind of car, like what the Tata car is, all the way up to the highest level to people who want to show off and have big luxury, sexy looking cars. Uh, but this whole idea of sharing, of course, is transforming our entire economy. Anyway, I know we have other things to get to and we're very far behind, so I think I'll cut what I'm going to say a little bit short. But it's been an absolute pleasure to meet you. If any of you are interested in our predictions, our work, you can go to our website, which is just digitalcenter.org. Center spelled the American way, or as I like to say, the right way. <laughs> and I'm just teasing. But it really is an honor to be here with you in India, and especially in God's country. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>